people underestimate how good a coach Mike Vrabel is, bro. They do it every year, man. They yeah. underestimate our physicality. They underestimate what a run game, a elite run game can do to you. They underestimate what our defense is. They do it every single season. They just think they see Tannehill in our little receiving core and think that we're just not going to win nothing. People got to understand as well. I mean, everybody wants to win the Super Bowl. It's a process to get there. When you on a mission or whatever, I mean, you set goals. That's why I always mention, hey, man, we need to worry about winning this division, get to the playoffs. Ain't nobody selling for meteorology. All that foolishness, y'all say. So I got a dream that I'm gonna be at the top of the scene. Uh, I'll never restrain, making my presence something to be seen. Yeah, I'll make them all see that I could be anything I wanna be. If you got a dream, then you need persistence and lots of belief. Yeah. Yo, don't take that Negative energy, I replace that I just wanna be me, I don't fake that I just wanna be free, I chase that I got a new obsession It's helping and teaching and giving everyone a lesson It's living and winning and building something that's impressive I don't wanna do the same thing, I wanna be progressive all So I'ma make a new me, a new beast, a true fiend He's everything that he wants to be Look in the mirror what he wants to see It's a dude looking back at me I stay on track, yeah, track things I'm setting goals, life hacking I'm steady stacking I see myself being happy A better me with a strategy that I'm attacking Yes, sir. You know what the deal is, baby. It's the Titans Coliseum Podcast. I'm your host, Morocco, and I'm in the building with my other two co-hosts, RJ, Firestone, and y'all see we got a special guest in the house, too, man. Bo Scaife, what it do, y'all? Man, yo, 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 man. Appreciate y'all boys having me on, man. Appreciate man, you. Absolutely. It's a pleasure, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. It's a, it's a good little, it's a good, well... It's a, good, it's a good Friday. How about that? It's a good Friday going on. This day, the other man, we having a good day. No doubt. You know, I hope you guys enjoying y'all weekend. You know, this day and the other. So, hey, is it, we gonna do a big today, man? It's gonna be a good show. Most definitely, yes, man. Firestone, you got anything you want to say before we get this thing rolling? Man, I'm excited, man. I'm excited for the guest. I'm excited to pick his brain about a few topics. I know it's not just football, but we got a, a couple other topics to pick his brain about today, too. So, you know me. I'm, I'm excited for today, man, and I'm ready to get into it, man. Uh, yeah, most definitely, man. And uh, before we get to it, man, I just got to throw this up out there because some people may not know. You should know, especially if you're a Titans fan, but Bo Scaife is the only tight end in NFL history to have a receiving touchdown, rushing touchdown, a kick return, and a tackle in the same season. And honestly, that's one that's one of the many reasons, man. I I got the utmost respect for you. You came to Nashville, you put in plenty of work for the organization, man, and blessed to be here with you, man. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. You know, I was just out there trying to be active, man, and making shit happen. <laughs> Ah, yeah, oh, most yeah, definitely, man. RJ, go ahead and get us started off, man. Oh, yeah, man, we're going to get it started off, man. You know what I'm saying? Let's go ahead and break this ice real quick, man. What you think them Titans going to do this year? I feel really good about them. I think, uh, you know, the last couple years, expectations have been whatever they are. You know, everyone's always excited at the beginning of the year, but I think this year um, has a little different tone. Um, you know, obviously getting D-Hop is huge, you know, our, our – our Achilles Hill has been scoring points, you know, down the home stretch and, and making those plays that we need to make, you know, to win those big games towards the end of the season. So, you know, having a playmaker like that, um, a leader, a guy, you know, who's going to, you know, command the locker room and just go out there and lead by example um, and, and be that big target for, uh, you know, Tanny to throw to, you know, that's something that everyone has and all the good teams have and you need, especially late in the year so. I'm excited for him. You know, hopefully we can get, you know, big D. Henry going. You know, that's obviously a key, you know, to the success of the team. And, you know, we know defense is going to hold it down for sure. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. I hope we get Derrick Henry going in the beginning of the season because it just seems like it, like, it takes to, like, the mid-season to him to really be going. But I will uh, ask you this, uh, Bo. Uh, how many wins you got us at, at this season? I, I would like to say 11, 11 wins, 10, 11 that's, wins. That's about where I'm at, too. You know, 10, 11 that's wins. And, and, and it can always be, you know, you can always squeeze in a, c a couple more like 
this, the games are decided by a few plays, you know. So, you know, when I was playing, you know, especially that year, you know, we went off 10-0, and 0, you know, we could have easily started off, you know, 6-4, and 4, you know, but we made those plays, um, you know, that, that decided the game. And then the year after that, when we started off, you know, 1-5, and 1-6, and six, we weren't making those plays. It was the same, almost the same exact, same exact team. So, you know, the key is, you know, you, you take it one quarter at a time. The first four games, you know, you want to go out there and try to be 3-1, and one, if not 4-0, and oh, and just get those first few games under your belt and get that momentum going. So, you know, coaches always stress that, uh, you know, those first few games just to go out there and, you know, get the pass popping and, and make some plays and get everyone acclimated to that first, you know, those first couple games of the season and, you know, get things rolling offensively and defensively and special teams. Yeah, absolutely, bro. And I know, like, um, you know, last year we had the win and get in type situation at the end of the year, which is kind of similar to y'all had in 2007. Um, you know, y'all had Vince Young and then Vince got hurt. Then Kerry Collins came in kind of kind of similar to us, not saying, but, you know, Tannehill got hurt last year. Then we had Malik come in for a little bit. Then we had to replace with Dobbs. So what was kind of like your expectations for us going into that game to, you know, win and get in? And then what was your thoughts afterwards after how the game turned out? You know, that's that's why these coaches get paid all that money, right? To make those big decisions on, you know, who's going to lead the team and stuff like that. So obviously, you know, Dobbs, he came in, he showed what we can do. He made some plays, you know, Malik, you know, everyone wasn't sold on him yet. You know, he, he has some tough, tough games out there, some tough times out there, but that's all a part of the growing pains of the NFL. All the young quarterbacks are going to have it. And it's up to the, you know, the front office and the coaches to put the right guys around them and get them acclimated and comfortable when they're in there, no matter who's playing quarterback. So, you know, that was just going to be a tough situation, no matter who was playing quarterback, especially with the, with the young guys, you know, coming there and try to win that game. So, you know, you do your best. That's why you got to have a solid defense and, and a strong run game because you can't put it all on the quarterback's back. And then when you do, you know, you got to take your shots. I'm always really hard on the coaching staff because I feel like – the great staffs and the great coaches, they find ways to get guys open to, um, you know, create plays and create opportunities for guys to make plays. And I don't think we did a great job of that all the time last year. So, you know, hopefully this new, uh, you know, this new coordinator we got and, um, you know, some of the new offensive schemes that we're running, um, you know, work out for us. And, um, you, know, you, you know, we see a little more explosiveness down the field and, and in the run game. Oh, so you mean to tell me that Todd Downing is a bad offensive coordinator? That's what you've been telling. <laughs> well, I don't want to. I'm not a huge fan of him. I'm not even gonna lie to you. I'm not a huge fan. You know what I mean? Okay. I mean, I grew up with Kyle Shanahan, so I mean, I'm spoiled. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and and you see guys like Andy Reid and you know Sean Payton and all the great play callers. They know how to call plays where guys just get are open. And you got to have those plays throughout the game, especially with the younger quarterbacks where, you know, as soon as they get the ball, they have, they know exactly where they're going to and it's going to be open. And I don't think a lot of coaches um, have that ability in the NFL like they should. You know, obviously they all get paid well, but that's part of your job is to be able to draw up and scheme up plays on the go or in the game plan where, you know, you're, giving your, you're getting your guys open and the best chance to be successful. And, um, you know, if you can't do that, then every game is going to be a dogfight. And then you're going to run up to the, uh, to the teams who've got the great coordinators offensively and defensively, and they're going to tear you apart because they're going to outcoach you just by scheme. Okay, so, Bo, I got to ask you this, man. Um, one of the big complaints about Ty down in last season was his use of uh, Chig. I'm not going to slaughter his last name, but, uh, man, people just felt like, man, whenever Chig had the ball in his hands, he made plays, and that was the issue. He really didn't see the ball too much with Ty down. And so this year with Tim Kelly, man, um, in what ways would you like to see um, Chig being used? Well, when you got such a strong running running game like the Titans do, I mean, you gotta make use of that play action. You gotta make use of that play action, and even running the two tight end scheme, you know, you gotta be able to have two guys that can go out there and make plays for you and help you in the run game, where you know you can pound, 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 and then find a way to slip guys behind the defense. Um, which is what our team is set up to do. And now with the addition of D-Hop, there's no reason why we shouldn't be throwing the ball down the field to him and Chig. So, you know, like I said, it goes back to just being able to be creative and being able to find and ways to get those guys open and get the ball in the hand of your playmakers. That's the key to winning games in the NFL is you've got to get the ball to your playmakers. 
So, I mean, you know, having Derrick Henry is a huge weapon in the pass game because it just sets up so much if you can get him going. And you know teams worry about how to stop him because, you know, that third quarter get here, that fourth quarter get here, if he's rolling and rumbling, then they're going to be in trouble. So it just opens up the game and makes it easier. And that's what the coaches really got to focus on this year. Right. So I wanted to yeah. uh, ask you this as well, man, because uh, we got a young tight end, a rookie tight end on our team uh, that uh, is on a similar path as you. You know, um, you were drafted 2005 uh, in the sixth round, and Josh Wiley, he was drafted uh, this year in the fifth round. And uh, he struggled uh, throughout the preseason this year, but um, – I just wanted to ask you, uh, what are some of the obstacles you went through your rookie year, and what advice would you give Josh Wiley? The NFL is tough. I mean, it is it is tough sledding, but, you know, you got to really study the game. And I think that's probably one of the things that helped me be successful early in my career is I just understood the game. You know, we, we ran a pro-style offense at Texas, so I was used to running and being in that kind of system um, and I caught the playbook really, 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 really quick. So, you know, I remember being nervous those first couple games, but the faster you can get a hold of the plays, the faster you can play. And you got to be able to play faster there. You can't be out there second-guessing yourself um, and, and thinking twice about something because you're going to get beat or, you know, something bad is going to happen. So, you know, getting your playbook, putting the extra time. You know, I've seen a lot of the tight ends this year, the preseason, dropping a lot of balls and stuff like that. You know, get on the judge. You get your first couple of years and, and really throughout your career, you just got to be accustomed to putting in the extra work. you got to put in the extra work because, you know, Zach Peeler used to always tell me, you know, he'd be like, hey, Rook, how are you going to help us beat Pittsburgh? You know, how are you going to help us beat Baltimore? I mean, that's all the older guys want to know is that they can depend on you in those big, tough games, in those close games, and we know we're going to have them. We know the majority, 90% of the games are going to be close games in the NFL. And someone's going to have to make a play that's going to win the game or put us in the right field position so we can kick a field goal or, or whatever it may be. So when that opportunity is called, you got to have the confidence and the, and the wherewithal where, you know, you can step in and make that play when your number's called. And the only way you do that is just by studying it and rehearsing it and building good habits and doing it every day in practice. And what's better than having a great defense to practice against every day? We had a great defense to practice against. So, you know, I learned so much against – you know, going against Bullet, Chris Hope, you know, Van Den Bosch, the Freak. Those guys helped me become a better player, and I wanted to play against them because I know Sundays was going to be easier um, because I, I was playing against the top guys in the league already each and every day. I was going to say, man, you can also put yourself into to Chig and Josh Wiley's shoes because they were both drafted in, like, the lower rounds of the draft, man. And I feel like you you blossomed, you know what I'm saying, whenever you when you came to the Titans as a lower round pick. And I feel like – if, if you could talk to them, man, or something, man, you can give them some advice. You know, we we trying to win a Super Bowl here, man, so <laughs> you feel me? <laughs> so give me as much help as possible, you know. Yeah, man, like I said, it's, it's just routine. And, you know, all the guys feel like they should be drafted, you know, earlier. You know, I mean, if you lift it up to me, you know, I'm a first, second-round draft pick. You know, obviously I had three ACL injuries, so that's why I, my stop fell. But I knew I had the, the ability. And if you don't play with confidence in the league, it's like they smell in blood. You know, they smell that blood if you're not out there walking a certain way or playing a certain way or blocking a certain way or hitting a certain way. Like, those defensive dudes pick up on that, and they're going to jump on you. So you got to go out there and play with confidence, play hard, and, and make your presence felt because that's how you earn respect in the league. You got to make your presence felt, and the way you do that is by hitting people in the mouth and making plays. Yeah, and, and so, like, kind of to that point as well, Tuesday was just cut day. So I kind of want to know, like, well, what's it like being inside that locker room on cut day? Like, what's it like being a player? And, and for you, since you was, you know, like you said, coming in three ACL injuries, you was a six-round pick, did you have any concerns at cut day that you might get cut, or was you pretty confident in that locker room that you was going to be, you know, solidified being a draft pick? I was pretty confident that I was going to make the team. You know, I, I started every preseason game. Um, you know, I was practicing a lot with the one and stuff like that. So all the signs were pointing towards me making the team. And I was making plays. You know, my rookie year, I came in, I, I had a, a torn abdominal muscle. So I remember, you know, I was walking on the treadmill during, uh, you know, OTAs and all that type of stuff. And, and Bullock used to tell me, he said, man, I didn't know you was on the team. Man. I just thought you was a coach. 
You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> but first day of training camp, though, I'm out there making plays. You know, yeah. so, I mean, that that really is, you know, the deciding factor is just going out there and making plays, and then you let the chips fall where they may. Um, obviously, it's a business. You know, it's a numbers game at times. So you got to go out there and put your best foot forward. And, you know, what do you want your work to look like? What do you want your film to look like? Those are things you got to look at. And because, you know, every day you're going in there and as a team and you're watching yourself and you're being critiqued and you're being graded by your peers and your coaches and stuff like that. So if you don't like what you are putting on film, then, you know, the coaches are probably ain't liking it either and your teammates probably ain't like it. So, you know, it, it's a respect and you got to go out there and whether it's practice, walk through, whatever, know what you're doing and go out there and make it happen. And, you know, everyone's going to see it. So if your opportunity doesn't fall with the team that you got drafted with or that you were playing with in training camera during the season, then maybe you created another opportunity for yourself with somebody else because it's a it's definitely a close-knit network, coaches talk, personnel, um, front offices talk. So, I mean, they have a good tap um, on the guys, you know, around the league. So, I mean, there's other opportunities around if you just make plays and, and you're a good player and you're a good teammate, you know, people are going to hear about you and they're going to talk good about you. All right. So, Bo, you mentioned that it's a numbers game when it comes to the back end of that roster. So, your rookie year, I mean, um, what was going through your mind as, you know, those cuts were happening? And uh, actually, before you get to that right there, is there any particular area in your game that you were working on to make sure that you got on onto the roster or – did you did you focus on what um you could do better or did you focus on your strengths? I focused on being a complete player, like and being trusted. You know, I wanted the coaches to trust me. Like, you know, we had Aaron Kenny, we had Ben Troop, and then I was the third tight end. And that year we caught as a group, I think the second most catches ever by a tight end group in NFL history. You know, both of them had 50 some catches. I had a rookie record, Titan record, 30 some, 30 some catches. I think Chi broke it last year. But um, I just worked on all the parts of my game that I needed to work on. Obviously, you know, blocking is a big thing in the NFL. And, you know, Jeff Fisher wanted to run the ball and stuff like that. So you got to be a, a guy out there who can, you know, hold the line of scrimmage, you know, be good on the backside, you know, hold your ground on the front side and, you know, help out the tackles. You'll be able to pass block and stuff like that. So, you know, technique is so important. So I was just trying to, you know, soak in all the knowledge I could on how to be a better blocker and understand coverages and, and how do I get open against this or, you know, against these type of players. So, I mean, I really was a student of the game and, you know, I never was worried about catching the ball and all that. You know, my hands is icy. They've always been that way. So I was just trying to focus on the little things. And in the league, the little things are the big things. So you focus on the little things and you make them consistent and those good habits form and it all just starts coming together. And like once it comes together, then you're like I said, you're able to go out there and play with confidence and you got to have that in the league. And to answer your second question, I was it was sad watching the guys go. I mean, especially your rookie class. You know, I remember, you know, y'all come in together, 15, 20 dudes, you know, you grow that bond for, you know, five, six months. Um, you know, we have roommates at the time at the Maxwell house over there and, you know, you, you get close to these guys. And so, you, you know, it's sad to say goodbye. Um, and, and, you know, you wish everybody the best, but I mean, it's just the business of the NFL and, you know, it's a harsh reality that everyone has to deal with, you know, whether you're a rookie, whether you're a vet, you know, there's some guys, you know, who, who've been with the Titans and I had to face that later in my career where, you know, I was there for, you know, five, six years and I had to say goodbye to all the guys at, at some point. So, you know, everyone's on the clock, no matter who you are, you know, in the league. Okay. I was going to say, uh, so to, talking about uh, locker room stuff, uh, what was your most memorable, uh, I guess, moment in, a, in the Titans locker room? And after that, you could tell us, like, your most memorable, you know, moment as a Tennessee Titan in, in period. It, if it's like playoffs, you know what I'm saying, Some, something like that, you know, regular season games. But what was your most memorable uh, time that was in the locker room with you guys? We had such a close knit team, especially the team you know that, you know that went thirteen and three. We were such a close knit team, and you know it was built with all the pro bowlers and, you know, Kerry Collins. We had Vy, like you know, we just we was a close knit team, and you know, all our road games meant so much to us, and like that's where you really get to bond with everybody. You know, 
on the locker room and the playing on the road games. And I think that's where, you know, I probably had the most fun is, you know, on those playing ride back, you know, you you go into Baltimore, you know, you go into Chicago, you know, you go into Kansas City and you whoop their ass. You know, the fans is pissed at you. They're talking noise, but everybody quiet. You know, you get on that plane, you like, hell yeah. You know, people throwing eggs and stuff at the bus. You know, you get middle fingers and, and you like, hell yeah, we whooped y'all's ass. You know, and, and then you get to sit back, you know, you get to sit back and, you know, drink you a nice cocktail and, you know, talk about the game and everything's uh, easier to correct and, and much more, you know, fun when you win. You know, on the flip side, my last year there, you know, we lost nine in a row. So, I mean, it was hard to go to work every single day. You know, you put so much effort into winning games. And so it, it, that was the flip side of things. It's like you just do everything you can. You put all this energy and effort in just to win. And the winning feels so good. But at the on the, on the flip side of it, the losing hurts. Um, I probably think my most memorable moment um, at a Titan – was playing Baltimore, I think, in the playoffs. I think that was an amazing game. I just remember, like, you know, no Sean Moreno got that, uh, he got that viral video where he was crying during the national anthem. And, you know, I had a similar moment during that game, just, you know, just like, damn, man, like three ACLs. They told me to quit foot playing football. You know, I didn't listen to nobody and people asking, why is he still playing? He ain't going to make it to the league. And here I am, man, one game away from the Super Bowl. Um, you know, so, so just to be able to reflect on those moments and, you know, play against, you know, the Hall of Famers that we were playing against that year, you know, all the guys on Pittsburgh, you know, Ray, you know, Ed Reed, you know, that Baltimore team itself, man, is you live for those moments. Um, and those are things that I cherish and will never, ever, ever forget. You know, I was really blessed to play in an era with a bunch of great players, you know, and, and we see them all. They all going into the Hall of Fame right now. So, you know, I know I was out there putting in the work against a lot of the great players that played in the NFL. Yeah. And, you know, I, I got to bring up, because this is one of my favorite Titans teams, but, I mean, I know it's a touchy subject, and you was on it, the, the 08 team, man. And that whole run, the the 10-0 and 0 run, man, all the way up to when we when we beat the brace off Pittsburgh, man. And <laughs> I, I, for real, thought we were going to go to the Super Bowl, man. That was the first feeling that I had yeah. since, the, the ni- since the 90s, you know what I'm saying, in the 2000 team. And it's just like, you know, I just hated how it ended because, like, that, that game, it, that, that, the way we lost to Baltimore in that 08 game reminds me of the, of the Cincinnati Bengals game, man. It still hurts me to this day, you know what I'm saying? So, I, you want to give your feelings on, on, that, on that season, you, know, you, you can. It was, it was, you that know. game was just tough, man, because, you know, we came out, you know, boom, boom, boom. You know, we feeling good, and then we fumbled in the red zone. You know, we, we knew we could beat them. And then, you know, Chris Johnson gets hurt. And then we fumble again in the red zone, you know. So, like, anything that could happen that was going to destroy our chances happened. And it's such a game of inches, and you can't make mistakes. You know, the game don't forgive mistakes, you know, the majority of the time. And, you know, they got a third and 29, you know, to Todd Heap. So there was so many things where, you know, we had opportunities to win, and, or, you know, to really, you know, build a lead up and, and take the lead and put the game away, and we just wasn't able to capitalize. And that's just how it goes sometimes. And, you know, you hate that it has to end like that because, you know, like I said, we won game away from the Super Bowl after that, and we know we were a better team. Uh, we had beat Baltimore that year. We had already beat Pittsburgh, and we knew we had to go play Pittsburgh again. So, I mean, we was going to go in. They was going to have to come to Nashville, and we already knew what was going to happen, you know. So uh, that was a tough – that was a tough game, a tough way to end the season because it was a really close game, really close loss. And, you know, I know everybody was hurt, but, you know, we felt like we were going to bounce back that next year and it just didn't work out like that. So it just shows that, you know, no matter what you got on one year, you got to go bring it back and run it back even harder the next year because you're not guaranteed the same results. Yeah, and, and you was kind of talking about, like, the, the adversity, you know, people saying, you know, you should have quit you doing football with the three ACLs. And, like, how did you turn that adversity into, you know, motivation and feel you every day to, instead of listening into it and, and kind of submitting to what they were saying and taking their advice, how did you turn that into to fuel for fire? Well, I mean, I was in a dark spot, man. I was, I was fucked up. I can't even lie to y'all, man. Like, depressed. Like, I was ready to end that shit. And I was drinking, I was on drugs, you know, I, I almost flunked out of school. Um, and this is kind of how my cannabis journey, um, you know, started. You know, the opioids was making me sick. You know, I, I was 
taking painkillers and all this shit they were prescribing me and it was just making me sip and it was messing my head up and you know and cannabis was really just kind of helped me slow things down and just really navigate through my thoughts and be like it gave me hope you know like all right bro like you still got a chance and i started feeling better so i remember coming back um after my third acl um that spring and almost had flunked out of school and you know my parents were disappointed like you getting ready to you know blow this whole opportunity at least go get your degree and you know i remember just you know coming back off of christmas break man that time and i just it was just like a light switch just came on and one thing about adversity you know some people get burned in the fire and some people get built and that shit built me and it like turned me into a beast mentally and that was the only way that I was able to go on and push through all that stuff and make it to the NFL where I just felt like after I overcame that and I was able to get back and bounce back from that and just work my ass off to get back in that, like nothing could stop me. You know, nothing could stop me. And I went on to play eight years in the league after that. You know, after missing, you know, two years in college and, you know, your NFL dreams was pretty much non-existent at the moment. And like you said, all the haters and everyone talking shit, like, why is he still playing? Like, there's not a person in the world I thought I was going to league except me and God, you know? So um, just to be able to fight back through that and bounce back. And like I said, I, you know, I, a lot of prayer and just belief in yourself. And like I said, cannabis, you know, it really helped me just kind of slow things down and navigate my thoughts and just put me in a better headspace where I can, you know, focus and do the things I needed to do. That was the only way that I was able to, uh, you know, just pull myself out of that hole because it gets lonely down there, man. You know, it gets lonely down there when you're hurt, you're injured, you know, everyone's having fun. You know, you're not with your team, you're on the sideline, you're not going to the games, um, none of that stuff. It gets lonely, man. And, you know, I see how guys, you know, fall on those deep depressions and stuff like that. And to this day, I talk to kids and, you know, players all the time, you know, who deal with adversity through injury and that type of stuff. And, you know, how to overcome it. And I just always tell them that, you know, you fight through this, it's going to make you and turn you into a beast mentally. I mean, in, in life, like, it, the mind is the battlefield. I mean, that's that's what we all up against, no matter whether you're playing football or just in everyday life, like the thoughts that you are going through in your mind every single day. And you got to keep them as pure and as positive as possible because, you know, it's so easy for, for things to go south if they're not. Right. Many people say you are your own competition, man, but uh, you kind of already touched on my next question I wanted to ask you, but um, what got you into football and, you know, just take us down, you know, your path, getting to the NFL, you know, making it through the NFL and where you are in life right now. I mean, I started playing football eight years old and I remember my first tryouts they canceled they were canceled I was the only kid there and I don't know what happened they canceled the tryouts and I was just devastated but it just became like my natural love you know I played football basketball baseball like I was little Bo Jackson and um I used to wear that shirt Bo knows all you know cycling baseball football I used to wear that shirt every single day man and I you know I love Bo Jackson and um, football is the only sport I felt like where it just gave me that freedom. And as a young boy, a young growing boy, you need that freedom where you can just go out there and run wild. And, you know, it allows you to, to yell, scream, dance, to hit people, um, um, you know, to celebrate. It gives you so much and allows you to do so much. And as a young man, like, we all need that. We all need that place where we can just go out and let loose. And football the sport itself just allows you to go out there and do that, but then it's also filled with all the lessons of discipline and preparation and working hard and, and you know, you get knocked down, you got to get back up and things ain't always going to work out with, for you. So it's filled with all these lessons um, that just you're going to need later on in life and then help, and you're going to need it as a man. And, you know, I just fell in love with it. And, you know, I saw I started, you know, being good. I was a big kid. I was a fast kid. And, you know, I, I was a, I took martial arts when I was young, so, you know, I wasn't like a tall like and, and big kid that was clumsy and lazy or none of that stuff. Like, I had great hand-eye coordination, and, you know, I, I just I just thrived, and uh, the game came to me really, really easy. Like, I understood the game, and I loved the game, and, you know, I, I see, like, the kids now, and, you know, I, I always tell them all the time, like, I don't think they'll ever be as good as the players that were back then, because... We were just outside playing, and we were naturally getting better just playing. 
You know, we were on the game and we were on the Madden and stuff too, but we spent a lot of time outside. And they don't spend as much time outside just working on their craft naturally like we did. You know, so we just turn. we really had an opportunity to play a kid's game and to be able to go play, you know, at Texas and have the opportunity to really go to any college I wanted to and then and chose the University of Texas and then play there and, you know, get close to winning the national championship and, you know, meeting BY and, you know, all the other dudes that, you know, that went to the league from Texas. I mean, that's when I really started seeing, like, I really had a chance. Like, other guys that I'm playing with at Texas, like, these dudes is going to the league. I'm like, shit, if they go into the league, I got to go to the league, you know? And, and that stuff motivates you. That stuff inspires you. And, you know, even with, um, you know, the injuries and all that type of stuff. And, you know, it's crazy, you know, the lessons you learn. I remember, like, my freshman year, the other tight end that was uh, recruited to Texas, he told me one time, he said, uh, he said, man, I was glad when they told you, told me you got hurt. I'm not going to lie. You know, because he didn't, he didn't have to compete against me. You know what I mean? But it just shows mm, you how yeah. motherfuckers be thinking, you know, some people, they scared of that competition. But some people run towards the competition, you know, and the competition is where you get better. And I was so blessed to be able to play around great players in college and pros where you just can't help but to get better. And that's why you see guys thrive in the league when they get to the league because it's better coaching, it's better players, it's better scheme. In college, you see dudes running wide open, scores 54 to 51, <laughs> all that type of stuff. Like, it's a whole different game, you know? Yeah. That game don't work in the pros, and you don't see guys running free and plays working like that in the pros because the dudes is smarter and they're more athletic and they out there and they take this shit serious, you know? And it's a serious game, you know, when you get to the pros. It's a very serious game because dudes is feeding their families, and dudes is trying to get to that Super Bowl and get that ring, man. So do you okay, think that's okay. going to change up a little bit with college now pay, paying their players that maybe that competition will step up more because they are going to get the incentive of getting paid, kind of like what you're saying with the NFL? Do you know, they, some got families, but not all, though. So do you think that will help step up that college competition a little bit? I think the uh, college is all how the coaches build that vision. Like, Mac Brown, like, was the master at, like, selling this vision to his guys like if we do this this and this here's what's at the end of the road for us and like as a young 18 19 year old you like hell yeah coach we gotta i gotta have that like i gotta be able i want to play on abc i want to be able to eat steak and lobster every day i want to be get all these gifts i want to get the the new playstation and all that type of stuff and i want to have the opportunity to go to the league i want to be the big man on campus and, and to, stuff like that. So it's you got to sell that vision and get your guys to buy in. And obviously it's harder with the younger dudes because they come from all different walks of life, all different economic backgrounds, um, you know, family atmospheres, circumstances, all that type of stuff. So to me, college is, is such a hard task because it's so many young dudes who haven't really developed mentally yet. So, you know, the coaches like the Nick Samers of the world, you know, the Harbaugh and, you know, all those guys – they know how to get their players to buy into the bigger vision. And that's what it's all about in college, to buy in that bigger vision, which is to get to that that playoff. Because if you get to that playoff, here's what's at the end of that. And everybody's winning. Like the whole school is winning. It's because of y'all. You know, so it's a it's a big responsibility. But, I mean, that's why them stands this field every day, every, every weekend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you – had the you had the luxury to play with Vince Young, Michael Griffin. I, did you play against you played against Lindell White and all them too? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I was at that game. That was my okay. rookie year for Tennessee, man. That was my rookie. Year. Okay, 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 okay. So yeah, you got to you got to play with the you know the great some of the Texas greats. You know what I'm saying? And you got to play on the same team as Lindell White even after the, the national championship game. This that and other. But how how was it like to play with those those guys, man? How was it? How did you feel when the Titans drafted all of those those great players, man? You know. Well, my first, my rookie year, you know, we went four and twelve. So I mean, that was I had never lost twelve games in my life. So that was <laughs> what the fuck is going on, man? Like I didn't come here for this, you know. <laughs> um, so that was a just a, a rude awakening for me, anyway. So not the long um, moment. Yeah, like come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Like what the hell, you know? And Steve McNair is our quarterback. How the hell are we losing all these games? And you know, so it was it was crazy. And I remember flying to the Rose Bowl, like, the day of our exit meeting. Like, as soon as Jeff Fisher let us go, 
buy my first first class ticket I've ever bought in my life straight to LA. You <laughs> know, to go to go see my boy. That, you that know? Was, that's probably the greatest game I ever seen, bro. <laughs> you know, people don't really understand, man, like how you know they VY gets his flowers for sure. But they really don't understand like the level of greatness that you know, he really displayed, you know, and he did, he overcame a lot of adversity, too, when he first got to Texas. You know, he wasn't the starter right away. He was the number one recruit in the country, but he didn't come in and, you know, start killing it right away. But once he got his turn, you know, the coaches kind of finally wise up and was like, dog, we got to give this guy the ball and let him touch the ball every single time. And so just to be able to, you know, see him handle all that magic. And even, you know, my rookie year, I'm betting all the guys – um, you know, in the locker room, you know, everyone's talking shit like Texas ain't gonna do nothing. Shit, we won again. You know, I'm, I'm taking everyone's <laughs> money that whole year. Donnie Mick, bro, <laughs> on Ohio State guys. You know, Jeff Fisher and them at USC. So we was on this crash, this crash course against them, and now they're talking about drafting them too. You know, Norm Chow and Jeff, like, like, damn, like, you know, they wasn't, you know, they wasn't really sold on all that type of stuff all throughout the year. But he kept, he kept winning. He kept winning. You know, the the people don't remember that. It was fourth and eighteen against Kansas, and if he doesn't get this first down, they lose, and they're not going to the Big Twelve Championship. Fourth and eighteen, and dude goes and runs and gets the first down. Everyone knows he's going to get the ball. So, even in the national championship, there were so many moments where everyone knew in the stadium that BY was going to get the ball, and they couldn't stop him. Yeah, the Houston yeah. game where yeah. you know we were in overtime, and he takes it to the house like. That shit happened in Houston, where he's from. So the dude was magical, man. Man, you got me thinking back to that uh, that Cardinals game, man. I think y'all started off that season zero uh, and six, and then Vince came uh, came back in as the starter. I remember that year. Y'all uh, got the six back to back wins, man. But that Cardinals game, man. I mean, shoot, that's one of the one of the best. Titans games, in my opinion, because of you know that magic of Vince Young, and I think you were uh you had uh caught a pass during that uh two minute drive, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. Talk to me about what was going through your head during that game. We just knew we had to go ninety nine, and it was about to be tiring as hell. Like that's like when we like, hey y'all, we got to do this. It's about to be tiring, but just come in. And he always had. You know, so much bravado when he come into the huddle, like, during those last-minute drives, like, and you just see he walks in there with, you know, chest out, you know, real, real loose, and he just makes you believe, man. He makes you believe, and th and when you believe, things fall your way. So even the passes I caught, you know, it was a tip ball that, you know, fell right into my hands, you know, 15, 20 yards, first down, you know. So, you know, it, that was an amazing night, man. It, in those times, in those games, like, I don't remember, and I come to Titans games, I don't remember games like that lit at the stadium. Like, the fans were so engaged during that time, and, and the games were so loud and, and, and the ruckus, and it was, we really had a true home field advantage when you came to Nashville. Like, and that was probably one of the greatest things about playing there. You know, we just had that stadium rocking, you know, with all the guys, you know, you got Cortland and them holding it down on, on the defense, and you got the D-line, you know, they they sacking the quarterback and teabagging dances, and they're doing all type of stuff. And, you know, it, it's just – it was such – it was so much fun just being a part of that shit and just, you know, soaking up all the energy from the fans in the city, man. And, you know, it was just probably literally one of the greatest times of my life because, you know, the fans, you guys made that shit so awesome for the guys. And obviously, you know, winning helps. You know, people pissed off when we ain't winning. So – you know, we do our part, y'all do your part, it all works together. And, uh, I mean, I'll never forget that shit, man. I, I mean, that's, Nissan Stadium was rocking, dog. Yeah. Uh, I say the three times, you know what I'm saying, that the Titans have been like a – like you know, it's, it's like that's my team. You know what I'm saying? It, it's been the 90s, you know, when they first got here with Steve McNair years, the years that you were here, and the, the time now. You know what I'm saying? It's the time where, you know, right now I feel like the Titans – they got a good show on this down there. We got a new stadium coming this down there. Yeah. But my question, I got a question, though, man. You got to give us a Cortland Finnegan story, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, man. You know what I'm talking about, man. You got to give us a story, man. You probably know that this is probably some shit y'all don't know, and they might get mad at me for telling me this, but shit, we grown now. They ain't about to do shit. So <laughs> we all live, man. <laughs> Cortland is a feisty dude, first of all, like, and he had to be that way. He was a seventh-round pick. 
He's the only, he was the first player ever drafted from his university. You know, he came in, you got to earn your respect, like I said earlier. So I remember we were playing Baltimore that year, we went 13-3, and three, and he got that, uh, D. Mason got in his head, and he got two personal fouls, like, back-to-back. -back. And he pushes Bullock on the field. You know, like, he pushes Bullock. Oh, I remember that game. <laughs> yeah. So I just remember being on the bus, dog. Like, I just remember being on the bus, you know, when we got after that game, man. Thank God we won. You know, and it was just, you know, thank God, you know, Lieutenant Bullock, you know, he, he kept his cool, you know, during the game. But, you know, I just remember how pissed off he was, you know, when he got on that bus and he was looking for Cortland Finnegan, man. And, <laughs> you know, like, thank God, you, you know, thank God you got big guys, you know, on the team to hold dudes back and, and, and stuff like that. But I remember, like, you know, KB was mad as hell at Cortland, you know, because he was just running his mouth. And obviously it's a heated moment at that time. And, you know, Cortland's a great dude. He's not about that life. But you may think he is because of all the altercations he gets in with those guy guys. The Andre Johnson, the Steve Smith. Steve Smith came to our locker room after the game looking for Cortland. He banging on the door. Oh, Where wow. Cortland bitch ass at? <laughs> Cortland, but that's a part of his, that's a part of Cortland's mystique, though. He knows how to get under those guys' skin. And, you know, it works on some guys. And, I mean, Andre Johnson is the nicest dude in the world. I mean, we would see Andre in Miami on the bye week. You know, we kicking with Dre. He don't talk a lot. But he did not like Corden. So, you know, obviously he rubbed him the wrong way. And you would never see a guy like Andre Johnson. I think a guy like Andre Johnson would do something like that in game and during the game. And, I mean, you obviously he was – he had hit his threshold. He had hit his threshold that game. And, I mean, we, we all saw what happened. I mean, it's, that shit is viral. I mean, I can't imagine that happening right now in this time. You know, just the amount of views and stuff. They would be – I mean, they would be talking about that on every network. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It would be everywhere. Yeah. yeah but Cord Cordell's a dog, though, show. man. Yeah, yeah well, you were watching on the show. See, that, that's, what, that's the point that I'm trying it. to – yeah, that's what I've been trying to stress to other people that talk about him. Cause I, if I talk to people that's you know that, that aren't Titan fans, and they may not even know much about the Titans. But when I bring up Corlin Finnegan, the first thing they bring up is him getting beat up by Andre Johnson. I'm like, nah, Corlin Finnegan was a dog, bro. I said, first of all, y'all gonna put some respect on dude's name. That's the only like, dude yeah, that beat him up, bro. Up. That's the only dude that beat him up. Yeah. Besides, like you know, yeah, dude, I'm like, like, I'm like bro, week in and week out, bro. He used to lock people down, yeah, bro. No, like yeah. he used to have they receivers mad, bro. Yeah. Like you know what I'm saying? Like and it just you know I. I our job, we want to get him on the show, man, so we can, we can, we can, he can clear his name a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause he got such a bad man. Rep, Cortland, so. bring your ass on the show, man, so you can clear the air, man. Yeah, yeah man. Sucks. Even the, even with that though, I mean, shoot, you can see Cortland getting up. I mean, he was clapping. I mean, the world saw yeah. him take an ass whooping, but in Cortland's head, Cortland really felt like he won, and that's what I try to explain yeah. to people because just yeah. like you said, Bo. I mean, Andre Johnson, I mean, cool dude. He don't bother nobody. He ain't on no type of, you know what I'm saying, time to where he want to just fight and, you know, get all tough with dudes or whatever. But in that moment right there, Cortland was able to get in that man's head and get him ejected out of a game. Well, it was all built up. You know, it was built up. This is years of built up playing against them, you know, just – hearing, talking shit, chirping, and all that type of stuff. So, I mean, like I said, he just had hit his threshold. And, you know, I think during the game, you know, he probably did some cheap shit and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of the guys, especially the vets, they don't like playing that type of game. Like, they're going to play mm -hmm. fair. We're going to go out here. We're just going to man up, and we're going to play the right way. And I'm going to whoop your ass fair and square. You know, like, you don't, we don't do all the little cheap shit. And some guys, that's their mojo. And there is nothing wrong with that. You know, but you got to be ready for the repercussions that come with that with the wrong dude. Because some dudes, you know, like a Steve Smith, he's not he's not about that. He's not going to let you do that. Like a key to leave, them dudes, like they're going to get under your skin. But some dudes is going to go fight back and they're going to take that shit in their own hands. So, I mean, that's why I love the league. Like it's just, it's grown ass men and they're going to handle business the way they see fit. You know, they don't care how much money they make or none of that type of stuff. Like, if you cross them or disrespect them in a certain way, it's going to get handled. So, so uh, Bo, who was the guy that got under your skin? You, you seen, you know, the <laughs> week come prior, you like, you watch a film like, dang, I got to see this dude, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, who was that guy? Bro, I, just, I just, you know, James Harrison, dog, I did not like that. Man. <laughs> I just, 
You know, <laughs> my dad's a still a fan, man. Yeah, he, uh, he loves. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> listen, I respect his career. His story is amazing. Like, you know, what I'm saying, like, special teams, the defensive player of the year, probably got one of the greatest, you know, uh, touchdown. He got the greatest touchdown in the Super Bowl history. But mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I do guys. believe that I do believe that you know he had a dirty side to his game. You know, I really do believe oh, that. Yeah. And, you know, we played him that opener and, and stuff like that. And, like, you know, I was watching, uh, you know, his football life, and he was talking about how he had to stop hitting people high because he was hurting people. And then they show him hitting me low, and he knocked me out of the game. So, like, I'm on the sideline. Like, he could have easily put, push me out, a bounce, da 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 And I just remember him just diving, like, right at my knee and shit. So, you know, there's guys that are like that. You know, they don't – obviously, you hope people don't have intentions of, you know, hurting people. But there are some guys out there, like – that are really okay with that. You know, I wasn't, you know, I remember Albert like stepping on Buddy's face, like, come on, Albie. Oh, like, dude, like crazy. Oh, come on, man. Albert. Like, <laughs> like what? man, you got to give, hold on, you got to give us a story on that one, man. How, how did that go Shit, I mean, in the locker room, bro? I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember what was said in the locker room. I just remember Jeff Fisher, like, get your ass out of here. Da, 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, what the hell is you thinking, dog? Like, stepping on someone's face. So I never had, and to people's defense, you know, some people are in a whole different mindset out there. You know, it's not the same dudes. You know, uh, David Thornton used to always, you know, he's a you know real religious dude, <clears throat> you know, a man of God. And he used to always, you know, we would be talking shit to him before the game. And he'd be like, y'all trying to get me to go to the dark side. Y'all want, y'all want DT to go to the dark side, won't you? You know? He's like, y'all want me to go to the dark side. And... And, and you know that's that's what you got to do out there. You know you got to turn it up because yeah. some dudes is out there turn. You know I, you play against a guy like Brian Dawkins. I mean this dude is out there hopping around like oh. like he the Wolverine and talking screaming out the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> like what oh, like what am man. I supposed to do with this dude? This dude is a beast and he got God on his side. It, <laughs> like, this shit crazy, man. So, I mean, the NFL got some got some crazy ass characters, man. But I mean, they some badasses though. Like these are some these some badass dudes, man. For sure. Yeah, we know it's a there like game, man. But it's definitely more of a mental battle more than anything. It is. You gotta just and you gotta find a way to just stay calm and not let all that adrenaline and everything, you know, take you out of your game. Because like guys like Cortland, like, that's what they're doing. Guys like Derek Mason, like that's what they're doing. They finding ways to talk shit. Keep bully. He gonna talk shit until he get a response out of you, you know. But he's pushing that button for a reason, you know. And that reason might cost you 15 yards and lose the game for you. So, like you said, it's a mental game, and you gotta be able to, you know, withstand all that verbal assault like every single weekend. Like, if they really mic'd up the game and people were really allowed to hear exactly what was being said, like on the sidelines and really on the field, like. I mean, it, it would be unbelievable. I mean, this is must-see TV because, I mean, these dudes literally have a real hate for one another, like, during the game. And then as soon as the game over with, it's like they hugging up. All right, big dog, can't wait to see you in Miami in a few weeks. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it, 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 it's, it's such a close-knit brotherhood. But between the lines, like, I mean, like, these dudes are, like, really your enemies and you have a hate for them. Mm-hmm. Most definitely, most definitely. So who was the pure character on the ten, on the Tigers during your time, though, man? Who was the guy that was like the the funny dude, man? Like, we just had characters, period. I mean, they weren't. Some of them weren't even funny. They were just. I mean, you got a guy like Pac Man Jones, like, yeah. like, you know, I, I got, yeah, I got. He was an up and down character. Wow, man, like, man, for like, wild, man. <laughs> That's a wild boy right hey, he there. Cold, bro. He was a cold returner, bro. I swear, boy. He, he kick one to him, man. He, take, he might take it to the crib. Like, yeah, you know? man. I'm, you know what? And I tell this story all the time. You know, we playing the Eagles, and, you know, Pac-Man was throwing up on the sideline. You know, he probably had a few too many drinks the night before or whatever, right? <laughs> he literally is throwing up on the sideline, and they call punt return. And he just ru- stops throwing up. Runs out there and he took that shit ninety yards. Mm. Damn. He that was that was he that took that like he that. took that shit ninety yards and buddy was just over here throwing up. You know, so mm. the ability is amazing. Like I said, but the characters, you know, like we had such a great team. I mean, my favorite character obviously is Keith Bullock, man. He just he he he's always gonna speak his mind. 
And, you know, you don't have a lot of guys like that. Um, and he wasn't afraid to speak his mind to the coaches too. You know, I remember like that. We would a few of our exit meetings. He would uh, he would raise his hand. He'd be like, "What are we gonna do to address defensive tackle next year?" He raised his hand again. "What are we gonna do to stop the da da da?" And he would just do that to piss the coaches off. But you know, what I'm saying like he really, <laughs> you know, like how is this shit gonna help us in the fourth quarter? Like he cares so much about the team and his guys. You know, and he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna stand so for no bullshit like with anybody like mm -hmm. disrespecting like his guys. You know, so I respect a guy like Keith Bullock and I learned a whole lot from him, man. And you know, to be able to be around guys like that, then you know, see like, you know, someone like Javon Curse the freak and just, you know, his stature and how people, you know, approached him and how people love the freak and you know, you see how people walk up to him and stuff like that. And I mean, I'm just like I said, and, and then a guy like Vy, you know, this is your quarterback, but you know, he's joking around. You know, he's making everybody laugh. Like, you know, he's not the traditional quarterback that they were trying to put him and make him be and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, I mean, we had just a nice round group of guys who were really stars in their own mind and really star A-listers, you know, throughout the league. And you know, the hardest thing is to make those guys gel, but, you know, we were a, a player-led team. You know, coaches really didn't have to do much. All the, you know, the vets like Bullock, Vanden Bosch, you know, Kevin Mawai, they policed the, the locker room really, really good. And, you know, they had everyone buying into what the vision and what the goal was. So, you know, it was easy to have fun. And we, have, we had a lot of fun. But we worked really, really hard when it was time to work. And so, you know, I just remember those playing rides and, you know, you got smashing and dash. They sitting up like, where are we going to be when we land? And, you know, we win. We know we're going to have a good time. We're going to party. And then we're going to go and go to work the next week and go whoop somebody's ass again. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. dope, man. That's dope. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned that about, you know, the guys police in the locker room. I mean, what that makes me think about is, leadership and you starting to see some of that with the team today i mean uh jeff simmons i mean you were just talking about you know the guys out there trash talking and he's one of the biggest talkers on the team right now man but he's yeah. also growing into one of those leaders who you know that's holding it down in that locker room that's you know showing guys you know this is the way we gonna do things the other shit ain't going to be tolerated. But outside of Jeff Simmons, um, who are some of the guys on this current team that uh, resemble some of those leaders back when you were playing? I mean, he was he would probably be the main one, I would say. Him and the safety. You Kevin know, those Byer, two guys. Those, those two guys, man, like – you know, you can see the passion that they speak with. You can see the passion that they play with, and it's just contagious. And you want to be able to follow a guy who not only, you know, talks that shit, but he backs it up when he's out there. Um, you know, Derrick Henry, he don't really have to say too much, but, I, you know, you know he goes out there and he does. It. And this is really just a – it's really a different generation, too, and, and leadership has obviously evolved and stuff like that, you know, just with social media and stuff like that, but – you know, a lot of that stuff just has to be handled, you know, inside. You don't really speak about stuff, you know, to the public and that type of stuff. You keep everything in-house, man, because that's all you got, you know, good and bad. You know, they love you when you get, you know, when things are going good and they're going to talk shit about what you bad, but that's just the nature of the beast. So, you know, you got to find that camaraderie and that closeness, and leaders are the ones that set that tone. And, you know, Byron, I mean, he's, <clears throat> you know, he's probably one of the, the top ten Titans ever you know, at this point in his career now. And, you know, he's earned it. Like, you know, he went to, you know, he played in college out there and just to be able to transition and, and to be turned into one of the greatest Titans ever. I mean, that's the way it's done. You go out there, you work your ass off, and no matter what school you go to, because they don't care where you went to college at, and you just go let your play speak for you. And, I mean, that's the greatest thing you can do as a leader is just, you know, put on the tape and people see it and they're like, damn, like, he bring it every week. Nice. Yeah, nice. yeah, and and we've talked football. I kind of want to dive into the afterlife of football with you and what you've been having going on. Um, because we talked a little bit about cannabis earlier, and now you got your company All Pro that you you merge with cannabis, and you got you know uh, collaborations with Cookies now. So congratulations to that as well. Thank so you. I was kind of wondering, when did you know for life after football that you wanted to be in cannabis, and what was kind of that journey to get into the cannabis industry? 
Well, the transition, man, is is obviously a long fall, man. I mean, everybody has to deal with it. I mean, most dudes' careers don't end the way they want to. Um, you know, everyone kind of leaves with a bitter taste in their mouth. You know, you just want to be able to walk out, you know, that last Super Bowl with the confetti. And, you know, it hardly ever works out that way. So, um, you know, for me, you know, I, my, my, my career ended with a neck injury. So, I mean, it was pretty much a wrap after that. You know, you hurt your neck. It's hard to kind of bounce back. You know, teams kind of look at you as a liability at that point in time. So, you know, at that point, you don't feel like you're ready. And no guy feels like – most guys feel like, damn, I still got some juice in the tank. But the teams might not feel like that. You know, I see guys right now, they're working out. There's guys working out right now that should be in the league. And, you know, they're waiting on that call. And that call, you know, there's a small percentage that that, chance, that call is going to even come. And, you know, it's like when do you push stop? And, you know, it's a hard decision to make because you don't even know what the fuck else you even like to do. Uh -huh. You know, you've been this, you literally been doing this since you were a little boy. And most people, it takes them a lifetime to realize their dream or to achieve their dream. You know, you were, are achieving this dream that you had from when you were a little boy to, you know, your early 20s. And you made it. And it's greater than anything you ever could imagine. But by the time you're 30, or if not sooner, it's a wrap. And you're sitting here, and you're just like, you know, you've made money, you've met a lot of people, you know, you've had some, you've accomplished all these accolades, but you're looking around, and, and you're empty. Because you don't get to do the thing that fulfilled you every single day, and the thing that you loved. And, you know, it's just a hard pill to swallow. And, you know, for most guys, a natural transition is just to go into coaching, because, you know, that still gives you that peace that you get that you had when you were a player um, for me you know I always I had an, uh, a revelation when I was with the Patriots and you know for the first time I remember you know Robert Kraft he was addressing all of us at some function and you know I just had this revelation where I didn't want I didn't love playing football anymore and I was like man that's what I need to do I need to be like him meaning like I need to go not go to the massage parlor not, not, not that type of shit <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no wrong with a little happy ending. <laughs> I know that's right. But, you know, I wanted to go. I wanted to go build something. You know, I wanted to go build something. So you know, the way you go build something is you become an entrepreneur. And you know, as I mentioned and alluded to earlier, you know, you learn a whole lot from the game of football and just you know playing at you know a big university and playing in the league. And you know, you learn so much. And all these things are able to travel and carry carry on with you as you you know go f further your professional career. So. <clears throat> You know, I went to business school. You know, Keith Bullock actually called me and he he said we need to go. There. He said let's go get our masters. I'm like, what? I'm like, dog, you don't even like school. I don't like school neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and you know he's you know, he's he's you know he like say son, don't worry, B. Let's just go get this get this paper, B. I'm like, all right, cool, man. So I go, man, and I remember it was cool, man. I'm we seen uh, Sean Merriman was there, David Baldwin with us. Uh, you know, Wale Agunle, Chester Pitts, um, Andre Davis. There was a bunch of guys <clears throat> in this program. Uh, David Thornton, uh, Cato June, uh, Gary Brackett. So it was like you walk in this room, you're like, man, these are dudes I don't really like or fuck with at all. Like, so it was <laughs> – right, these, these are like our rivals. You know what I mean? So we walk in there, you know, it's – I'm glad I'm with KB. I'm like, cause you know, KB ain't about to, you know, he ain't with none of that shit. So I'm like, I'm, I'm walking behind KB like, what y'all want to do? I'm with the lieutenant, you know? So, <laughs> but <clears throat> it, it, it was really cool though, because, you know, going back to school and, you know, when you go back to school and you get your master's and, you know, you, you work on an MBA program, it, you're going to, and you're getting an education for what you're going to do. And when you, when you learn something that you can directly apply to what you're doing, like the education is totally different. Like, we're not learning some BS, miscellaneous information that we're never going to use. Like, we were learning stuff that we were going to directly apply. And, you know, I wasn't sure what I was going to do yet, but I know I was going to go and start my own business. You know, I, I've i always been a mentor, so, I, you know, I, I, I danced around in mentorship and public speaking, and I still do all those things. But, you know, I ultimately found myself in cannabis. You know, I'm from Denver, Colorado. Um, it would have been legalized there since 2014, and... You know, I've always been a consumer for the most part. <clears throat> and so this, you know, I was hanging out with these guys one time and they was like, man, we need to get a license. And he told me, he said, Bo, it would be financially irresponsible for you if you don't, if you're not to get invest in this industry and get in this industry and you from here. And, you know, I went home and I thought about it and I was like, 
you know, this is a big, this is a big jump because cannabis, even right now, y'all live in the building, you know, it's not accepted. You know, people look down on this stuff and, it, you know, they think it's drugs and they think this shit is the devil. And so I was really worried about, you know, my reputation and how people were going to feel about, you know, me dancing around and being involved in this industry. You know, even at the University of Texas, like weed is not cool. And so, um, you know, I was like, fuck it. I'm gonna go do this, man. And, and you know, I remember my dad telling me, and my dad is from the South, he's from Arkansas, and he was like, uh, he said, so you think you just about to go get you a license and some land and grow some marijuana? And I said, uh, I said, dad, no disrespect. That's exactly what I'm about to go do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's what I did. You know, I went and I bought, you know, 140 acres and, you know, I was like, damn, I can grow up. I can grow a ton of weed on this. And, mm. you know, at first I had to just kind of learn the business, you know, so I took my growing pains, just like being a rookie in anything. Like, you know, I had to learn the playbook. I had to learn the playbook. I had to learn, you know, what was going on in the business side of things and how, you know, people are growing these plants and, you know, what I was comfortable putting my name on and stuff like that. So, I mean, it took me a couple of years to really just get things dialed in and find the way I wanted to. But I always, you know, knew the plant, you know, had medicinal benefits and, you know, when I was young, I, I wasn't really, you know, hip to it. But, you know, as I got older, you know, I studied these benefits and I know people are using it for pain management. They're using it for stress, anxiety. They're using it to get off of opioids. You know, my mom passed away on Mother's Day of this year from opioids. And, you know, sorry. To hear yeah, I'm on, a, I'm on a real path right now to, you know, help people, you know, and, and, and promote cannabis as a viable option, because, I mean, that stuff. Well, you know, would have really saved her life if I would have been able to, you know, if it was looked at different and more widely accepted. You know, the number one death, cause of death for older people is, um, it's called polypharma, where and that means they're on so many medications that, and they just don't mix well, and they end up dying and causing more complications for them. And, and you know, cannabis is a plant. And, you know, I, I get to see and I build facilities and I get to see how this stuff grows and, you know, you water it, you feed it, you love it and you take care of it and it produces, you know, a harvest and it's really like the cycle of life. You know, you plant a seed, you know, you water it and you feed it and you get a harvest. So, I mean, there's so many beautiful, you know, stories and narratives that I get to use and, and talk about, you know, with this industry. And, and I love it because that's not what I was taught growing up and that's not what everyone was taught growing up. We were taught that, you know, this plant is a devil, it's gonna make you lazy, you know, it's a gateway mm -hmm. drug, this and that, but that's just not the case. So I'm just excited to be where I'm at now. And, you know, we launched our brand, um, All Pro, um, officially last year. Um, we got about 10,000 feet of cultivation where we just cultivated these beautiful plants. And, um, you know, now I'm just, I'm probably in about 30 to 40 stores out here in Colorado and we're just building the brand. and. You know, I'm hosting these private tasting events for people so they can come and, you know, be get educated on the events and, 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 you know, get to sample the product, you know, just like just like it was wine. And so, you know, I'm going to be taking this show on the road, man. So I can't wait to get out to Tennessee, man, and, you know, just so, be able to bring the brand out there and, you know, have these private intimate events and just really educate people on, uh, you know, what cannabis is really about and, and find ways that it can help them as well. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer and I'm an advocate and, you know, I'm just excited to be here. And, and this has really gave me a lot of direction and purpose in my life. Um, and then for me, it was a natural transition for me to be here because, you know, it's hard to find something else that you love, um, you know, outside of football. And trust me, I don't, I, I don't love cannabis as much as I love, you know, nothing will ever be able to replace, you know, playing in the league. I mean, it's... It was the most incredible, wonderful, wonderful, humbling learning experience I could ever ask for. But uh, this is this is a great second career for me, man. It's great, man. And Before we let you get up out of here, Bo, and I'm going to turn it over to Five Stone as well, man. I got to ask you because I asked all my buddies this, that smoke, man. What's the strain of the day? Man, I'm smoking this shit called Oreos. Mm, yes. Uh, bro, and this, I mean, this... This shit is so smooth, dog, and it just, man, it's just, it just, this shit gonna have you like this, man. You gonna be Uplifted. sitting, there, you gonna be sitting there watching the game like this, man, in peace with a big ass <laughs> smile on your face. 
<laughs> if y'all got a girlfriend, if y'all got a, it's a, it's a hybrid. But if y'all got a girlfriend, she's gonna be like, what? She's like, what? She gonna be like, what you so happy about? She she's not even gonna be able to phase you though. She's not even gonna be able to phase you. You gonna be, you gonna be one, which you gonna be so one and 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 one in harmony and just enjoying self right there, man. And you know that's what I love, man. The plant and these strains and the stuff that I'm growing, it really makes people feel good, man. So. That's what I love about it is being able to provide stuff and, you know, people say smoke your stuff and they're like, damn, bro, this is awesome. I, I feel amazing right now. And so, you know, I, I love being able to do that for people. That's great. Yeah. Man. That's so great. I, I, I got to ask you, too, are you sativa or are you mainly indica or are you just balanced on hybrid? I, I, uh, I smoke it all. Um, for me, mm -hmm. I got this. I got this. I call it the all pro pack. So I got a sativa in the morning. I got a hybrid and um and I got indicas and I got a special hybrid. And so for me I, I launched four moods. Game time, crunch time, downtime, and playtime. And so the sativas, your hybrids, your stuff for the nighttime, and then the stuff, you know, just to make you feel good when you go out and stuff like that. So um, it, it's fun to be creative with the marketing. You know, obviously I wanna, you know, tie the sports and kind of build that bridge between, you know, cannabis and professional athletes. So uh, this is the fun part is being able to, you know, get creative with it and just like educate people and, and have fun with the marketing and the names and all that type of shit. Do you ever right. think the NFL is going to allow it? Even I mean, I know it's probably going to take time to get legal, but do you think even if it was federally legal do, that the NFL would look upon this with, and as a possible factor for some of the players and their pain and CTE even possibly in the future? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's definitely coming. I mean, I think legalization obviously is the biggest obstacle, but it's definitely coming. And I mean, all we're doing is adding it to the already incredible sport experience. Like people are already smoking on game day, no matter what, anyway, you know, they're drinking, they're eating, they're smoking. Like you go to all the stadiums, people smoking in stadiums anyway. I smell it at all the stadiums, you know, because it's just, it's a mood enhancer. It makes you feel good. You want to have a good time. So, you know, it, the, the best thing about weed is you're not going to have that hangover that alcohol is going to give you. You're going to be able to wake up and go to work and feel good the next day and not have to worry about all that type of stuff. So, I mean, to me, that's the oh, no. ultra oh, benefit. No, bro. Oh. I'm a whole other different story, man. I'm going to tell you this <laughs> funny story about me. Okay, so I'm not much of a smoker. I really don't even smoke marijuana because I ain't going to lie. I mean, I turn into a whole other different person. Like, I'm a straight up just mute don't say anything just stuck on stupid so this one night <laughs> or whatnot um i was on some I believe it was gorilla glue i was on mm -hmm. and you know um uh, i had been you know puffing here and there whatever i like hit it a couple of times i'll be cool i won't be just so stuck on stupid well i took too many pulls this one night and when I tell you, dude, it was the worst experience ever. It was like, dude, I, I literally felt like a stone. I was just like, I was trying to go to sleep, couldn't go to sleep, cause my head yeah. was spinning and, and uh, my mouth was all dry. So I'm just constantly going to drink water. And this right here went on for about, <laughs> it went on for about three hours. <laughs> yeah. That's what, listen, that's what I tell, that's what I tell people all the time though. People who have had bad experiences with cannabis, it's because they smoked something that was probably too strong for them. So if you a beginner oh, yeah, smoker or something like that, case, man, and that's my head, yeah, that's, that's exactly the case. The place. Once I started coming down, I was, head was spinning, headache. I said, man, they feel like I've been drinking hell. I mean, but listen, but I guarantee you though, when you find that right strain for you, like that right strain for you, it's gonna have you feeling like you float, man, and you're gonna be in a good mood. So it's just about fun. Mm -hmm. It's just like finding anything. You got to find that thing that's for you, you know. Yeah. And so I mean, it might take a while. And I mean, where did you buy that stuff? Like, if you buying that shit off the street, ain't no telling where it's coming from or what's in it. Right. You know, I know what I grew up smoking isn't the same shit I'm smoking now because what I grew up smoking, I don't know where it came from, and it was illegal. So it came from either a dirty ass basement, a dirty ass garage, some dirty ass closet. Ain't no telling what it was sprayed with or none of that type of stuff. So, I mean, all that stuff affects the high. So the stuff that I'm growing right now, like, it's in a clean, beautiful environment. And, you know, this is some Whole Foods type weed. You know what I mean? 
It's great. Yeah. And see, I'm out here in Oklahoma, so it's legal out here. And for me, like, I got to smoke Indicas because I have bad anxiety. I was in the military, PTSD, all that stuff. So, like, I'm really high strung. So, sativas run my anxiety up and almost make me feel like I'm having a panic attack. Where mm-hmm. then if I should yeah, smoke Indicas... Indica's brings me down, levels me out, and lets me be chill. So I always kind of know that, like, I stay away from sativas, and then I stay more focused on indica because that's where my strain is. So it's it's just understanding that and being educated with the system too of what what each flower does and what their purpose is for for to help you. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah, and that's yeah, the, and that's know. the whole education piece. Yeah. 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 And I uh, I I use I don't smoke anymore. I used to smoke. I used to smoke. Every Damn, dog, no, you missing out. You, you, know, you missing out, RJ. Nah, I, I can't, time. man. Hey, I, see, now, I, the one thing I will preach about marijuana is marijuana had different effects for different people. No doubt. And for me, it it made it made me lazy, man. I I love the I love the feeling. I love smoking with friends and having no good high conversations, man. I, I love it. But me, I was lazy and I was I was at a point in my life where I was like, nah, I can't, I can't. Well, I can't that's why you smoke it before you go to bed, you know? man. You know what I'm saying? That's <laughs> yeah, why you smoking. Uh, yeah. That's why you smoking when the day is over with, man. After you get your shit done. So, <laughs> all right, man. So shit. Yeah. So when I had a smoke system, man, you ain't coming to smoke with your boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And see, but the thing is though, I, I'll come. I, look, I just won't smoke. I'll go over there and I have them same. Con- it won't be. I won't be high doing no. it. You know what I'm saying? But I'll go Listen, over there and have them same conversation with my people. I had a party here. Yeah. I had a party here. There's a place here called the Marijuana Mansion, and everybody mm. who came in there and didn't smoke. Believe me, they got that second hand, and their ass was in that motherfucker. Uh, yeah, they was in there. They was in there. Yeah, they was in there. Like, damn, I feel they, like shit. I'm feeling good as hell in here. Like, goddamn. Yeah. yeah, I look. I ain't got no problem with no weed smoking, man. I can't judge nobody for some stuff that I did. You know what I'm saying? I did it. <laughs> I, hey, I roll up the weed for you if you need me to, man. I, I'm, hey, hey, I'm a pearl king, dog. RJ, if that day me? come, though, man, you got to chief with Bo. I mean, that's like a once in a <laughs> yeah. lifetime oh. opportunity. You can't turn it down. Just like I told Pat Man, because I met hey. Pat Man at a uh, autograph signing uh, last year. I told him like I don't smoke, but dude, like if I ever just got the chance to, like I Smoking would with have to chief chief with you. Hey, hey, Bo Man, I, I, hey, you want you you a good you a good Titan, bro? And I love watching <laughs> when you was on Titans, bro. But I'm gonna let you know one thing: you ain't Wiz Khalifa, bro. Yeah, Wiz Khalifa, the only person I smoke weed. <laughs> Well, shit. Don't be mad. Don't be mad when you see Wiz over there with me, though, smoking with me. Then you're gonna be like, "Damn!" <laughs> hey, listen, this is crazy, dog. So, you know, 420 is a big holiday out here. Oh. Uh-huh. So I went to a little smoke session around the corner from one of my stores, um, and I walk in the room, and then this older lady walks in the room, and it was Wiz's mama. Mm. And I literally smoked with Wiz's mama for like an hour, and we just oh, talked. We talked about everything. I mean, she. She is like a queen. She's the queen. That's where he got it from, for sure. Mm-hmm. That's where she got yeah, it from. So it I mean, like, oh, yeah. man, I love how Wiz Khalifa, my favorite artist, dude, to get high. Yeah, too, man. Oh, Wiz Khalifa taste, boy. I used to bump. Hey, I can listen from beginning to end, bro. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's well. Yep. But yeah, man, I'm we down. gonna go ahead and get things wrapped up, man. Uh, Bo, thank you for ro- rocking out with us tonight, man. And uh, no doubt, you got man. anything Appreciate you want to plug? You got anything coming up you want to talk about? No, nah, man, just you know, if y'all ever in Colorado, man, um, you know, come check out All Pro, man. Um, you know, my website is allprofarms.com. Um, we got a little shop too that's shopallprofarms.com where you can get some merch and stuff like that, some All Pro merch and stuff yeah, like that. I get some merch, man. Yeah, man. So. Uh, yeah. And like I said, I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring the party to Nashville, man. You know what I'm saying? Invite only. It's going. We pull it up. Yeah, it's going me. down. So I mean, we are gonna get it right before the game and after the game, and we are gonna have a good time. Yes, yes sir. sir. RJ, you got anything you want to say before we ride out? Oh man, it was lovely having you on the show, Bo. Man, we gotta do this again, man. You know what I'm saying? Maybe during the season no when doubt. the Titans is you know 12 and 0. You feel me? No <laughs> doubt. No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Well, most definitely. I, we, we enjoyed your company. Man. Appreciate y'all, yeah. boys, man. Ah, uh, yeah. Five star yeah. before we roll out. And now, man, appreciate you, man, and your time, man. It's a lot of a lot of fun, a lot of stories, and I always have fun talking Titans football and cannabis talk, man. So I, I truly appreciate it, man. All day, we on. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching, man. Tighten up and enjoy your weekend. Stay blessed.